to, to change the resolution. My name is Arturo Hamilton, as Shannon and myself mentioned. I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer, an AWS and Google Trainer. I'm a certified expert in a lot of different technologies, like uh, from, from Microsoft, well, Windows Server, Windows 10, SQL Services, System Center. I'm a SharePoint architect, and I'm also a multi-cloud architect and engineer. I'm a Google Cloud a professional architect, AWS professional architect, and Azure advanced architect. So I'm not showing off. I've been using the three cloud for a long time now, and well, Google recently, but the other two for a long time. And I have had a lot of hands-on experience with both and the three of them nowadays. So uh, any questions you have related to comfort issues you didn't see them in the presentation, please let us know in the chat or the questions and answers section, and I'll be glad to help you. With that being mentioned, folks, let's get started with our comparisons. Okay. First of all, we're gonna talk about sorry, let's skip this. We're gonna talk about the usage of Azure as resources because this differs a little bit from what we have in AWS and what we have in, in Google. Well, in this case, Google is not on the topic, but in AWS. When we talk about the resources that we have for Azure, let's remember that on the back end, we have a complete solution based on the Microsoft Cloud support, right? We can have hundreds, if not, if not thousands of sources that we can include. So we can fit up, as you can see here, developing solutions, operation solutions, and data management solutions. For example, you want to build a virtual machine. You want to build a logic computer that can scale itself. You can use a lot of different third-party and open source technologies to bring it up to the table. These kind of solutions are also available in AWS, that's clear, okay? But the benefit that we have on the back end is that GitHub and MSDN are actually powered enough, the fundamentals and the back end of Microsoft Azure. I'm not saying it's better. I'm saying that we have here the first comparison point. That's why we have it like this. If we talk about Azure as features, folks, let's remember that we have a pretty extensive catalog of services. The catalog that we have in Azure, it's powered up by Microsoft products. That's the difference that we have with AWS. AWS is powered up by some Microsoft products. They have some uh, proper agreements of usage, but they also have a lot a lot of third party and open source products available. What we can do in both of our uh, offerings, both of our platforms, is to build computing, application management and development. We can have identity control. We can have advanced e-commerce management. We can have IoT. We can have artificial intelligence. We can have machine learning. It's important we remember both of these cloud offerings tools are optimized, are optimized to fit and suit any of the needs that Okay, that's like to start. Now, let's see a little bit about the distribution and the comparison between them. In Azure, in Microsoft Azure, we have, sorry for the resolution, that's the one that Microsoft gave you, but we have 60 plus regions available in the world. Okay, we have a pretty extensive list of countries covered, not optimized for Azure, but optimized for the communications and bridge endpoints. These are called the edge points. You can see 140 different countries can actually have a Microsoft connectivity. For example, if you go to Central and South America, you'll find that we only have maybe two Azure regions. We have two regions in, in Brazil, and we have one coming up in Chile. What about the other countries, right? What about Argentina? What about Uruguay? What about all of them? Well, we have edge points locations where we can host some storage, a content delivery network, or just a communication. On the other hand, AWS folks is also distributed, but they are, they have a little bit less uh, number of regions because they don't have the coverage of Microsoft 365, okay? Again, this is not, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, don't worry. This is not a thing that will say that Microsoft is better, no. It's important we understand that Microsoft offers other products, right? We have Microsoft 365, we have Dynamics, we have ERP, we have uh, device management consoles. We have a lot of on-premises products that we don't have in AWS. AWS is fully optimized. Uh, global coverage to have enough regions to offer the same kind of connectivity latency and response that we get with Azure. Both of them, both of them are available around the globe. Let's remember that that I was mentioning. The difference here relies on the kinds of products that you can get on one on the other. 
Okay, both are optimized for cloud computing services, for cloud communication services, for cloud storage services. But, but obviously we have the collaboration of 365, Dynamics and some other stuff in Microsoft. That's why it looks a little bit different if we see one of the maps against the others, okay? Remember, both have data centers, okay? The, the way you name them or the way, the way you refer to them is different. You can see a region uh, in Azure, for example, is a data center, but a region in a data center in, in, in AWS, it's considered availability zone. Let's not confuse the terms. At the end of the day, what we have, it's a, a data center that can be one or multiple locations closed as a, as a cluster or, or put together as a cluster together so they can respond as one. Just to give you an example, the region we have in Washington State in Redmond, West US2 of Microsoft Azure, it's a compound of multiple buildings. We only see one region. The region we have, for example, in London for AWS, it's a three buildings region. Three or four, I mean, they, they were planning to extend that. We only see one region, right? We see West US in Azure, we see London in AWS. At the end of the day, we need to remember that this distribution is considered to be like this in order to have high availability, resiliency, continuity, et cetera. Okay, that's, that's the objective of these regions. Now, every region has products. Depending on the region that you're using, this is just an example, I and mean, we, can, we can navigate, but depending on the region that you're using, folks, you'll have a different list of products. For example, in Asia, in the United States, you can create a semi-quantum computer that will cost like $150,000 a month in Chicago, in the central US region. But you cannot create the same kind of computer that is the graphic advanced series uh, in Texas or in, uh, in California, in West US. The same happens in AWS. Based on the region, the kind of infrastructure they use to build it and the distribution of services might give you different options based on your location. This is an important consideration for both, for both cloud folks. Why? Because if we talk about sovereignty, if we talk about governance and location, you know, obviously you know, that it's important to know what, what are you able to do in your country or the country where you are supposed to be delivering the service, right? Well, this is an important consideration for both. Not all the services are in all the regions, okay? Some of them are here, some of them are not there. You have to go to the maps and the distribution of services of each if you are going for something special. That will be my recommendation. These regions, folks, are paired this means that we have one region in one hand, one region on the other, and we have a cross distribution of attributes like data, configuration, settings, uh, features and characteristics in order to give some consistency and continuity. All these region pairs are usually distributed in a geopolitical uh, enclosure. For example, North America, for example, Europe or European Union, for example, uh, the Eastern countries, for example, Asia. So your, your copy, your pair could be available in Japan, Japan East and Japan West. Or your copy could be, for example, in London and France. Talking about, well, London is no longer far, well, the UK is no longer far, but the European Union, right? What I'm talking about here is that with or without our configuration, our services will be distributed. Okay, we don't actually have to do this manually. We can have some peace of mind by knowing that all this is applied by the cloud. This is like a basic distribution of the clouds. Now, the access, my friends. Both of the clouds, both of the platforms have their own access rules here. In Azure, we have the Azure portal. In AWS, we have the AWS console, okay? If we go here just for a second, one second, this is the Azure portal, right? You can see here, a basic port. If we go here, and we go here to the AWS console, you can see we have a management console. All right, well, it's locked me out. <laughs> there, let me just log back in. 
And this is the first time I'm logging these browsers. So you can see we have something called the zero trust protection that basically asks you, I'm, I'm a little bit blind here, 37C25Y, that looks better. There, and my password. I just want you to see a couple of differences between them both. The AWS console that we have now on screen, you can see they got a new console. It's actually a little bit friendlier than the previous one we used to have, with the difference that it's pretty heavily focused on the distribution of services. You see, for example, you have here, what if you want to create a computer or what if you want to create a network? Well, you have to look for the type of service and then create what you want, you see, a virtual computer. On contrary of this, Azure or Microsoft is heavily focused on the actual service, you see virtual machine, not computing. And then I have the option of creating a virtual machine. So even though the way you work with both clouds, I'm sorry if it's too small, let me just zoom a little bit because I forgot the resolution, but even though, it, let's be honest, AWS looks a little bit loaded with information, both will get you the, the same result. You get a computer, you get the features, you get the extra components, you have the computer one, and that's it. How do you do that? How do you achieve that? Obviously, it depends a lot on the consoles, but both of them have a visual supporting console. So you don't have to worry. Okay, now that I'm talking about the computers, we have computers and computers. Well, in Azure, remember, folks, are here that we have the services called virtual machines, right? And if we check what we have here, we have the EC2, Elastic Computing Resources. Okay. At the end of the day, both are virtual machines, both are computers host in, an, in a virtual environment. We can access them via a network, right? We can have a direct connection, a VPN, we can have a lot of, for example, we got a question in the chat, what, what's the difference or the difference between a virtual computer and a virtual local area network? Well, the difference is the computer, it's an actual server. The local area network is how you connect those servers together in a distributed geography, for example, three or four states, three or four countries, right? A wide area network. Well, in Azure and AWS, folks, we can have the service. You can see here, this is called BPC, virtual private connection, and in Azure is called virtual network. It's the same. It's the logic way your services, not only computers, will communicate in both. Both have the same list of resources, balancers, traffic loaders, traffic managers, gateways, firewalls, proxies. We have them in both. Today, folks, the clouds are so important that you can connect a network in here, in Azure, to a network in here, in AWS. You put a gateway, you, co you configure a VPN between them both, and your computers in Azure will talk with the computers in AWS. The same for Google, the same for Alibaba, the same for Cisco, the same for any cloud provider you have in mind. So instead of referring of a comparison here, what we should take from this specific discussion both is that both of them can collaborate. You don't have to live with one or the other or, may, or put them against each other to see which one is better. From this specific perspective, the management of resources, computing, applications, and uh, networking, we have a pretty similar experience between them both. But now here goes something quite important, the identity. And this is where we will notice a big difference. In Azure folks, we have that old service that we all have hear about it at least called the Active Directory. If you haven't heard about it folks, then you have been living under a rock for the last 25 years because we have had that since 1997, 1996, 1997, Active Directory. It's a thing that we all at least have seen somewhere. Azure, Microsoft owns the Active Directory service. And Azure is an active directory for cloud. So a note, if your company, if your customer, if your own decision is that you wanna go for cloud and you or the company has been using active directory for five, six, 10, 20 years, what you already have, it's natively and organically compatible with Azure. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is impossible for AWS, but the difference in here is that in AWS folks, 
we have something called the identity access management. That it's also an identity manager that can read what you have in, in Active Directory, but it's not an organic transaction, right? Because this is an identity manager created explicitly for Amazon Web Services. So this is one of the highlights or the differences. If you have a pretty complex identity solution on Active Directory, it will be easier to move into Azure than into AWS. Both are possible, yes. Both are doable, yes. You don't have to worry about one of them not working, but consider the native support you have in one and the other. Okay, so we have, if we go here back to the services, we can start looking like, okay, each of the services you see here will have an option to be accessed via identities. But as you can see, we don't actually have something that says identity management or something that says uh, Active Directory, right? We have an option of security where we can start configuring our identity. And you can configure here, for example, identity management, certificate identification management, identity access, and you have here the counterpart of the directory. But you can see here, we can create users, groups, etc. But check what I was saying about the name. If we go to Azure, we have an active directory. I'm not putting Azure over AWS in here. I'm mentioning this is a native solution that we have had for a long time. This is a solution that is compatible with a couple of extra considerations to be taken. Okay, that's another difference. Now, we talk about identities, we talk about basic computing, we talk a little bit about the networks. There is something else here that both do amazingly well. Data management. Here, on control of the Active Directory, we have a thing that plays against the names, SQL. You might have read about SQL or SQL or however you prefer to pronunciate it, the data management solution of, of Microsoft. On control of the directory, SQL is quite limited for big data, data processes, our data, data analysis, data intelligence, machine intelligence with data, data learning, all those amazing things we have these days related to data are quite over the capacity of SQL, for example. Both of our services folks in Azure and AWS are capable of receiving a migration batch of information whenever you need it. That's a good thing. You don't have to worry about having terabytes of data and having to use an internet connection to upload it. You can actually ship them back to the uh, data center and they will connect the server, they will connect the disk into the the location so you can copy fast. That's a good thing. Both have this option. But let's remember, if you remember what I said a few minutes ago, AWS is optimized with third party and open source technologies, right? One of those technologies is HD Insights. You might have read about it or you might have an it. issue. It's okay. We have Synapse. We have uh, Databricks, for example. Solutions that today are so important that there is no way we can have a data process without it. SQL will be a database storage, like the way it has since 1995. But today, today what we need is something that is capable of handling thousands and thousands of processes. Just to give you a number, Microsoft itself handles 6.5 trillion authentication signals per day. In all their services, including Hotmail, Outlook, Xbox, etc. AWS handles around 4.5 just on AWS, without counting the Amazon services like Twitch, like Prime Video, et cetera. Well, imagine trying to handle that amount of information in a standard SQL database or a standard database that we may have as a popular service in the market. Today, folks, all the cloud offerings we have have to be powered up by services, by third-party services or big data services both of them have it, okay? The difference that we might want to know between them is that HD Insights in Azure, it's, um, I wouldn't want you to get this, like the actual definition, but it's a little bit old. Not out of the old, they have a, a, a little bit of an older version than the latest one available in AWS in production. So if we talk about uh, maybe some leverage, the capacity and compatibility for new features, it's on AWS. But at the end of the day, the data analysis remains the same. So don't worry. 
And another service that is usually quite important in here are the containers. Both have containers. Both can use Kubernetes. Both can use Docker. Both can use Mesosphere. What's the difference? Azure is optimized to use Kubernetes and Docker with their Active Directory. And if you remember, the Active Directory has a little bit of a leverage when we talk about retro compatibility and on-premises compatibility. AWS uses a pure or a little bit of a native solution of key ADS, that is Kubernetes. And they also have Docker clusters, Mesosphere clusters, etc. These options, folks, of containers are perfectly compatible with each other. The same that we mentioned about the computers, the same we mentioned about the networks, we can create in one, communicate with the other. There won't be a difference in here, okay? Just consider, just consider the connectivity to identities and authentication. Both of our solutions, folks, let me go back here for a second. If we click back on the services again, and we decide that we want to have, for example, some advanced application management with analytics and application integration, for example, here, we can select local services offered by, by AWS. You can have a function powered up by AWS. You can create, for example, um, an advanced logic analytics solution powered by AWS. On the other hand, if we go here, we can do the same by creating, for example, a function host by Azure. Why am I mentioning this specific part? because whatever you create for automation folks can be extrapolated to the other cloud, okay? If we automate a process of deployment, monitoring, management, we can graph the function, get the PowerShell code, the bash code, and use it on the other one. It's compatible, both of them are compatible, okay? So let's take a look on a couple of things that we might want to consider. Cloud computing. We said that we have the Elastic Computing Services and we have the virtual machines in Azure. The number of instances to, uh, templates that we have is 40 to 39. These are the numbers up to December 2021, okay? So if, if it changes in the next couple of, of weeks, well, will be an update. But right now, up to the wrap of 2021, we have 40 against 39. The capacity, you can have smaller computers in Amazon if you need to go for a proof of concept for a testing but you can have larger computers uh, in Microsoft Azure. You cannot create custom instances, like a complete custom image and then load it. You can actually bring your own instance, yes, but you have more capacity on the processing units of Amazon. If you, need, if you notice something here, there is not much, fun, right? <laughs> it's not like you are losing something against the other. That's a good thing. Something that I also mentioned, sorry, the open source. The open source partners are nine out of 10 the same in both. As I mentioned, AWS has a little bit of a, a, a further a configuration on open source partners because the way of they provide some services, for example, Dockers, for example, Mesosphere, for example, Hadoop Insights, I was mentioning with HD Insights, etc. But at the end of the day, folks, it's important we understand that whatever we decide to use as a third party or open source technology will be compatible with both. You don't have to worry about like, hey, I need to have this uh, in AWS because it's not compatible. For example, Redis Catch. I need to have a Redis Catch for integration and long-term retention. I can only use AWS. No, most of the technologies offered today as an open source solution are compatible in both. The way they integrate and the way they are managed is what changes, okay? The integration points could, could be completely different from one to the other, but don't worry, that's expected. If you wanna have like a little bit of a mapping, I mean, there is an actual list that you can find online in the Microsoft documentation, AWS documentation, that refers to the name of the service. But for example, if I want to create a resource, I usually use the resource manager. This is the resource manager. I go here, I click on, I don't know, uh, a SQL database, I click on new, and I have a resource front end with a graph, right? In Amazon Web Services, folks, this is called here cloud formation, and it's the same. I go here, I select my databases, and you can see different kind of databases. 
I have here a complete ledger database managed by, by Amazon. I can click in there and I can start my creation. Remember, it's the same. I mean, it's the same type of principle. We have a visual or a graphic user interface to provision our objects, okay? So a little bit of a comparison here, folks. The names, as I was mentioning, the terms. This a little bit, this is a difficult part, if you will. I start as a, as a Azure architect back in 2011. I've been using Azure for, for more than any other cloud. When I start getting into AWS, I can say from a first-hand experience that the hardest part is to remember the names and the comparison between them. Okay, so as a tip here, folks, if you wanna have a clear comparison or a clear visual, understand how it's referred in one and the other. The process, the features, the characteristics, the way it works, the connectivity, the dependencies and requisites are usually the same, or most of the times are almost the same. But it's a thing that we have to, con to consider. For example, if I go and say, hey guys, we need a SQL database, it's easy to find in Azure because SQL is a Microsoft term, or it used to be a Microsoft reserve term. It's not longer like that. But if I ask you, do the same in AWS, you will find something like SQL at first glance. It's the RDS. This is why it's so important that we understand that the services are, functionally speaking, quite similar, but the terms are different. And if we have other clouds and here, other columns of clouds, it will be the same. The names are changed to feel like, uh, like property, like unique from platform to platform. In computing, for example, folks, you can see here, marketplace is the same, images are the same, but Standard storage for virtual hard drives, it's called EVS, Extensive Volume Storage and Management in AWS. User data is the same, but the scale sets are different. So extensions, for example, what if you want to install an agent to back up the computer after the initial deployment? In Azure, will be called extensions, but in Amazon Web Services, it will be a data script. You know what? In both cases, you're going to run a script. An agent will run the script and will make it work. And the result will be the exact same thing. That's why it's so important that this comparison is always with us in our minds, okay? We have, for example, here, the storage on S3. An example here, the bottom one, it says Glacier. If someone from the government goes to your company and says, hey, I need you to keep a copy of your records, of your payment records for the next 10 years, the, the first thing you will think is, I need to keep it cheap, right? I need to store this in a long-term retention storage. In Azure, folks, that is called archive mode, but it's not a service. It's a feature of the storage account. In Amazon Web Services, there is an actual service for that. It's not a feature. That's another thing that we have to remember. In one of the clouds, you may find it as an extra characteristic of a service, while on the other, you might find it as an actual service itself. Take a look on the site recovery. Site recovery exists as a feature in AWS for the virtual machines, for the extensive computing, etc. In Azure, there is a service just for site recovery. So again, folks, don't try, I mean, in most of the cases we do, but don't try to find a pair-to-pair -pair, uh, or a site-to-site -site comparison if you don't find it on the comparison tables like this. We don't have a point to site. The VPN works the same for site to site and point to site in, in AWS. So a pretty important thing when we are comparing folks is that we would we wouldn't have always a one-to-one. -one. The functionality is there in both. I can bet with any of you if you want that you'll find the functionality in both, always. How the functionality exists, that's what makes this so interesting. The difference could be a feature to service, a service to feature, or a service to service. Okay? So both, both will offer, offer the same. We have, for example, the service level agreements. The service level agreements are quite similar on computing services or communication services. But the Route 53, that it's a networking service of, of AWS, has an SLA of 100%. I personally speaking, and again, I'm also an architect in this, I don't know how they, they actually commit themselves to reach 100%. It's difficult. 
but they offer 100% with a multi-redundant deployment of, of the route, something we don't have in Azure. There are no services in Azure that will offer 100% at all, none of them. The highest you can get is, is five nines, 99 point changes. But again, what we're doing here, folks, is comparing how much latency or how many hours, minutes, seconds, should I expect of uh, downtime in case of an outage, right? That's a service agreement. Both agreements are usually the same because the services work the same. As I said, the same functionality. Okay, so unless there is a service feature comparison, most of the times you'll find in both clouds the exact same service level agreement, like this, like what we have in here. From the security perspective, just keep in mind, everything is the same. The access, the role with access control, the identity access management, the principles, the systems, the accounts, the services. The highlight difference is what I already mentioned. Active Directory against Directory Services, okay? Active Directory being the same product we have used, Directory Services being a unique product, product of AWS with a full compatibility. That's the main difference in here, okay? Just, just to remember. And when we talk about management, folks, both can use PowerShell, and that's the best of all. If you want to script the solutions, deploy the solutions with automated uh, offerings, both can use PowerShell, both can use CMI. Well, as I was mentioning, remember, Resource Manager and Cloud Formation is our front-end graphic interface. At least. Both can be tagged to use a service. Both can be uh, administrated via concepts, for example. If I go back here, I have my console. You see, it's a cloud shell. It's a PowerShell scripting tool. Here. If I go here, I have my console. Both have a similar option. Okay, so as you can see, well, we are quite, um, uh, we have a lot of options and we are quite covered on the scenarios we might want to use to deploy our solutions. I can even, and this is important, you can even cross script, okay? There are new options today where you can register your subscription of AWS in Azure or your Azure subscription in AWS and run a scripts from here to deploying here or from here to deploying here. That's an advanced option. But again, what I want you to remember is that the name of the webinar is about the compilation. It's not like which one is better. Today, we got to a point where what we have to do is understand that both of them work together. Okay, both of them can coexist perfectly without having to go for one or the other if that's what we want to have. You can see we're right in here. We are right in here. I can start throwing some code and cross a script both of my subscriptions. Okay, both will support third-party technologies as I was mentioning. So you can use Apache, you can use Tomcat, you can use Spark, you can use Insights, you can use WordPress, you can use MySQL, Mongo, Cassandra, you can use Gremlin if you want, you can use PHP, Java, Python, Julia, R, etc. So again, what I'm saying here is that when we go to operating system endorsed uh, solutions or uh, third party solutions, folks, you can actually configure for one and then just reconfigure without rebuilding for the other. We are covered there. And that's a good thing. We no longer have to completely rework from scratch one of our solutions that we had on this or on this one. Okay? Some uh, final considerations, folks, that we have to, to include in our, in our minds. And well, it's the kind of connections and uh, how they work, something that is pretty important. It's how we define the capabilities. Both are actually meant to be used for connectivity and communications. The difference between one and the other, folks, is that in AWS, we have a cloud hub. For example, we got a question from Brett and Rayesh. Thank you for, for sharing the uh, uh, text uh, answer. If we want to build uh, a local area network, folks, and we want to communicate all the computers together within that area, that region, that location, we can actually create the local area network with side to sides, point to sides, direct connectivity peering using a network in both scenarios. But in AWS, we have an extra feature called the Cloud Hub. 
that will simulate a virtual area network without you having to configure it as long as the services are on the same network. If you think about it, it doesn't sound like a lot, but trust me, instead of configuring here, let me just close this one, network by network, where is my network? Here. <laughs> instead of configuring network by network, creating five, six networks, connecting them together, using a theory, putting some VPNs, and taking a few months there to build it, in AWS, folks, once we have our first network, we can start extrapolating that to create the cloud hub. So basically what we do is we, we simulate an area network without actually creating it or configuring it on our own. Okay, so that's another option. We can go to the network, we can create a standard network, and then once we have, for example, our virtual public cloud available, this is a virtual network, we can then put this into our cloud. That's one extra benefit. I mean, it's just uh, like a final uh, nice to have that we can get on one and the other. And finally, folks, to wrap it up, a little bit about management of these resources we mentioned in the last 40 minutes. Remember that in Azure, we have resource groups. In AWS, we don't have them. In AWS, we have uh, services and groups together based on subscription and review. The resource group can be used to put together similar objects, concurrent objects or collaborating objects. So it's a good thing. In AWS, we can put them together based on region, functional level for access permission. Both will support for you if you want and you need template deployment. Okay, if you use a resource group, you can use it via resource, or if you use AWS, you can build a template like this, sorry, like this, and with CloudFormation, you can make them talk to each other. Remember, when you build an automation script, a deployment script, or an advanced script, both of your solutions will be capable of reading them. Just keep in mind, keep in mind that the names of the services and the features will have to be retarget to your destination. Okay, so you can grab a resource you already have here, for example. For example, I have a storage account. You can create from a service you already have in AWS or Azure, I only have this one right now, that's what I'm using this, but in a, in a full configuration. You can actually go here, grab this specific service, and export a template and take a look on the template. The actual configuration of the template is a JSON file, similar to what we have in here. So you can actually cross check templates. Obviously, it requires work or reconfiguration. But what I'm saying is that both of our clouds can talk to each other. That's what I've been trying to say in the last 40 minutes. So this is our content. I know it's a pretty short content, but if you consider the number of training classes that Microsoft and Azure. And AWS have, we're talking about a summary of like six months of training. It's just for you to see the differences and the things that we can do with one and the other. Okay, so I hope this has been useful. I know it's a little bit of a, of a small amount of time to cover all the things that we would like to cover, but Shannon has a couple of special offerings for you. And well, in case you want to stay in touch, you want to connect in LinkedIn, or if you want to go to our web page and check for the offerings and promotions we have for AWS, for Azure, and cloud computing services, well, be my guest and please proceed and we'll be there to help you.